American football in Finland. The voice in your ears is Perfect Purpose, and this is American Football in Finland. Today, I'm joined by both of my co-hosts, Coach Q and Chris Green. What's going on, fellas? What's going on, people? How's it going? Good to be back this week. Let's get it. Yeah, we got the trio back. The AFF podcast is available on all major platforms, including YouTube. Wherever you listen, be sure to follow, like, subscribe, and rate us. Anything less than five stars tells us that you are a hater. It's first down, and in true fashion, we're doing playoff picture, guys. We're going to talk about the playoff picture, what it looks like right now. Spend a couple minutes on it before we get into the games and players of the week and stuff. But right now, I'm just going to run down the rankings, okay? In first place, Senayoki Crocodiles are eight and one. Second place, the Butchers are seven and three. Third place, the Royals are five and five. Fourth place, the Steelers are five and four. Fifth place, the Roosters are four and five. Sixth place, UNC is three and seven. Seventh place, Wolverines are zero oh and nine. If we talk about it right now, UNC is out. Right. They're three and seven. If they win their next two games, they still don't make playoffs. So they're done. Wolverines never were in it. Crocs and Butchers clinched their tickets at eight and one, seven and three. They can lose the rest of their games and they're both going to be in the playoffs. No ifs and buts about it. But in the last two spots, we got three teams. And it's kind of sad to say because I didn't think it would be three teams. But the Royals at five and five, Steelers five and four, Roosters at four and five. Now the Roosters are technically one game behind, but they have one more game than the, the Royals. My question to you guys is, how do y'all think it's going to shake out? I mean, you can put the Roosters at five and five straight away because they've still got the Wolverines left to play, so yes. they're pretty much at five and five. So they're there or thereabouts. The Roosters have got to play the Crocodiles and the Steelers. So big game for them next week is going to be that Roosters Steelers game. That's going to pretty much decide who's going to get that spot. Moreover, the Royals have also got to play the Crocodiles and they've got to play the Butchers. So they've all got difficult games that could go on. The Royals have their two games at home. Correct. I think that that's a big difference for the Royals. I think they just got to win one of these two games. I don't, I mean, I think. They could beat the Crocs, but that'd be asking for a lot. Like, they're not going to be able to do what they just did last week and just run the ball. And as soon as they have to do something else, they're in trouble because that D-line is just too good. But against the Butchers, I think they might be able to pull it off, honestly, that last game. Yeah, and also, like, the Butchers and the Crocodiles might be resting some legs. We saw this week that the Crocs didn't really run Christian Powell a lot. I think he only had, like, nine carries. So, they sat him down after the first quarter because he had nine carries and like two touchdowns exactly. or three touchdowns. Yeah, so so they you know they, that could happen in these games as well because for the Crocs and the Butchers it doesn't really mean anything. I think the Crocs are they they've probably got to win one more game to be guaranteed the one seed, right? So they're nine and one. Yeah, they pretty much got the one seed locked in, and then the Butchers. I mean, it just depends. Like they're going to be the two or the three, aren't they? It's unlikely they're going to be the four seed. So. They might it's unlikely the they're going to be the three seed. They'd have to lose these next two games. Yeah. And, they'd and have to the lose Butchers both. Have got, they've got the Crusaders to play as well, the Butchers. So, yeah. They're not going to lose that last game of the season to the Crusaders who have like 12 players. No, they're That's not it. losing that. No. What about you, Q? What are your thoughts on, on how it's going to shake out? I mean, the Roosters are on the outside looking in right now. That's your squad. Yeah. Um, it's a tough one, honestly. Is where it's sitting at right now. Um, let me see. Royals playing the Crocs and the Butchers. The Royals might actually get both of them without all of their player their players playing. That it might be like a a big fu to the Roosters if the Crocs and the Butchers decide not to play their starters. Oh, could you imagine? <laughs> they did that on purpose. Yeah, like if they did it on purpose to let them not really let them, but you know what I'm saying, give them a chance to win those two games, like. I mean, for both of those, for both of them, they don't really necessarily have to win that game. But, I mean, the Royals, that put the Royals at seven wins and five. They still would be sitting in, like, third or fourth. Um, I'm more worried about the Steelers playing the Roosters and the Crocs. Obviously, the Steelers get the Crocs at the, at, at the end, probably where they won't play anybody. So, that'll be one for them. But that Steelers and Roosters game is a crucial game, though. That's going to be a crucial game. 
Um, I I think I, I think I, for the Steelers, they're I mean they're five and four. They have three mm. games left. They only have to win one game, and they mm. just lost their best receiver. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a tough one right there. That's gonna be yeah, a tough one right I, now. But they do have Hope the Wolverines in those three games. The Steelers yeah. still have the Wolverines. If the Steelers can beat the Wolverines, I mean, they should even without Vincent McDonald, they should be able to beat the Wolverines. They're still going to get a spot, even if they lose to the Roosters and Crocs. Mm. Like if they so get it don't six really matter. Wins, so the Roosters got to win out. The Roosters have to win out with help, though. Basically, Roosters got to win two out of three with help. Mm. If they mm. beat the Steelers and the Wolverines, don't even worry. Let's just say everybody loses to the Crocs. If they beat the Steelers. And the Wolverines, they're Bruce in. The they're yeah. in because they have they have tiebreakers over Steelers and the Royals. If the Steelers beat, if they lose to the Roosters, beat the Wolverines, they're in. They don't mm. have to beat the Crocs because the Royals would have to win seven. They they yeah. can't get in with six. I don't think it's a crucial. It's a crucial one. The Royals the last two games are crucial. Yeah, if the Royal if the Royals yeah, if Royals win six and they're tied with the Roosters, they're out because the Roosters bo- yeah. beat them twice. Yeah. But they so the Royals are hoping in the Roosters Steelers game that the Steelers win. Yeah. <laughs> because Ooh, they can't, they right can't there. Beat the, yeah, they can't beat the Roosters into the playoffs. So they need help. If the Roosters beat the Steelers, I guess that's the game, really, the Roosters Steelers. Because if yeah. the Roosters win, they're basically in because they got one more game against Wolverines. If the Steelers win, they're in because they have one more game against Wolverines. And I guess my, yeah. my real question is, I mean, it's all hypothetical. We got two weeks to do this, guys. There's no games this week. So we got two weeks to mull over how it's going to go down. But last thing I'm going to say before we move on is, of these three teams, Royals, Steelers, Roosters, who would you not want to play in that first round to get to the Maple Bowl? Like which one of these teams looks more dangerous to you guys? You said out of out of the Royals, Roosters, and, and Steelers. Steelers. Who do you not want to play in the first round of the playoffs? I would I would I wouldn't want to play the Roosters in the first round. And why? Because I feel like Hitner is 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 he hit, he can he can open that thing up in the playoffs. <laughs> he can open that thing up. Not just him though, but Santu. And I'm and I'm going to this Santu situation because I feel like and it's, it sucks to say this, but if Santu was on any other team, he would be <laughs> a mega all-star. Yeah. If Santu true. played for the Butchers, he would have 16 touchdowns right now. 15, 14 touchdowns easily. Like, the Roosters are just one of those teams that don't – they don't necessarily run the offense through one person. And that hurt them this year, obviously, uh, because I feel like he – it's no reason why he should be going through these games. Look at the big games that he does have. Like, if he have a big game, he got, like, six catches, 100 and some, you know, yards and a touchdown. Like, like I just feel like they should have probably threw the ball to him more, a lot more in a lot of these games um, because Senadino's forced the ball to uh, Hitner or whoever. But anyway, that's another, another story. But I just think yeah. the Roosters can light up at any time, but they also can, can dim that light, too, in a quick second. So – um, I wouldn't want to play them, and I'm not just saying because I'm a fan of them like that, but I'm just saying like I wouldn't want to play them in the first round because they've been in the playoffs before organization-wise. They know how it is. So if you give them that inkling of, oh, man, we win this game, we win the championship game, I wouldn't want to play them, not with Hitner on there, you know, not 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 with what the running game has been doing. Um, I wouldn't want to see them in the first round. I'm being honest. Like in uh, Royals, you know, they 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 I, I won't say they're hit or miss. That's another team that I probably, you know, I wouldn't want maybe want to see Alpha and Timothy and, and Sawalski either, um, you know. But who knows, you know. But that, that's my that, that's mine. I just say I just stop it right there. I think the Roosters is the one team that I probably wouldn't want to see. First. What about you, Chris? Out of these three, are you going with the Roosters too or another choice? I, I, I'd I'd agree with the Roosters, but for a different reason. Okay. And the reason it, the reason being, I feel like they're as I, I've said this before as well. I feel like they're the most improved team this season. I feel like they've got better as the season's gone on and they're still getting better. Okay, albeit, I mean, we're going to talk about the butchers Roosters game, of course, but the poor game management in that that game, which cost them. But apart from that, I feel like they've 
they've they've uh, they've come on quite a lot this season. And with the addition to Kitner and how he's running all these DBs ragged, apart from when Alpha locked him up, they've been doing well. Yeah. But they have other weapons. You know, they've got Kyander, they've got Vekomaki. So they, they've got other talent on that team that they can go to if they need it. So I feel like, for me, the Roosters are probably the more dangerous team. I would then say the Royals. And then I would say the Steelers, just because the Steelers, I feel like they've got worse as the season's gone on, just with injuries and the loss of Reasonover and now the loss of Vinnie McDonald. Like, they're, they're struggling. I, I think they're the ones that don't make it in. If I'm honest, I I agree with y'all. I think I think we can say it's a consensus. The Roosters are probably the most dangerous team right now, even after losing to the Butchers in a game where we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> we're gonna stop talk about it. We ain't gonna talk about it now. But uh, <laughs> just my last thing on the whole like playoff picture thing is, I agree. It looks like I mean, just looking at how people have been playing the last couple of weeks, you know, the Royals and the Roosters probably deserve the spot. But the Steelers are still sitting in there off of those three Lee Anthony reason over wins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that, the, that's the only reason the Steelers are in it is early in the season they won some games and they won like two random ones since. They beat the Wolverines once since then, I think. And they still have a Wolverines game. And I think, honestly, I think I might pick the Wolverines in that game. We'll, we'll see how I feel in a couple of weeks. <laughs> But, yeah, that's the playoff picture. We don't know who's in. We know the Crocs and the Butchers are in, and we got three teams vying for the last two spots. If you're listening to my voice, you're now part of the AFF community. But don't be shy about supporting us. Head over to our website and order some AFF swag. Get a T-shirt for this beautiful summer weather. Or a comfy hoodie you can rock all year long. And if you really want the drip, scoop up one of our limited edition snapback caps. Everything you need to represent the AFF community can be found on our website at AmericanFootballInFinland.com forward slash merch. Let's talk about some of the key player performances from this week. Again, for all the haters, we just limit the picks to two players per game and go with maximum impact over stat patent. But sometimes stats add up. So here are key performers. First up, I got Ville Hamalainen. Running back from the Helsinki Roosters. Stat-wise, he had 22 attempts, 118 yards, one touchdown, and averaged 5.4 yards per carry. Um, yeah, I know the Roosters lost, but it ain't Ville's fault. That's for damn sure. When they gave this guy the ball, he ran hard and he got yards, and he really didn't have much trouble. Yet, very similar to what Suosti did, but with less carries, they give him the ball, he runs, he gets yards. That's all he did this game. And it's one of those things that the reason he's a key performer is you could rely on that, which, again, I think, <laughs> I'm trying not to get too much into talking about the actual game, but they had a situation where on fourth and one, they wanted to do a quarterback sneak instead of handing it to this guy. I'm just putting that out there. He was reliable all game. Your quarterback throws interceptions that gets the other team back in the game. In in situations where you could have just said, "Hey, I'm a get, I'm a trust number 33." So for me, he's definitely a key performer. He could have been the reason they won the game if they had done you know some things different. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Next guy on the list, Miko Seppinen, wide receiver from Porvoo Butchers. Four catches, 101 yards, one touchdown. As we've been saying basically all year since the second half of the season, pretty much Seppinen make big plays. That's what he does. That's all he really needs to do, and that's what he did in this game. He made plays when they needed it. Early in the game, he made a few a few catches. Late in the game, they needed him. He came through just like he always does. That's why he's a key performer. Next guy on the list, Riley Yeldell, quarterback of the UNC Crusaders. This guy is going to be underrated this week. I think a lot of people don't understand – how bad it really was for the Crusaders. I know they lost by, what was it, 39 to 22? What's that? 17 points. But they easily could have lost by like 25 because, oh, I didn't go over his stats. Sorry. Yodell was 23 for 45, 224 passing yards, three touchdowns, and 51 rushing yards. He was on the move all game. Their O line didn't block anybody. And he had to find ways to basically get the ball 
to the new receiver that they have, this like six foot six guy who's not a great route runner, who wasn't really getting open. RJ was pretty much shut down on the other side because they had Alpha and the corner kind of double side in him. So Riley had to figure out ways to get the ball to other people. Seth Rowland wasn't nearly as much of a a factor because the Royals had figured out a way to kind of guard him in the passing game. They could stop the run because their O-line couldn't block. And then they found a way to kind of cover Seth a little bit in the passing game. So it was all on Yodell to move them down the field. And throughout this game, they kept moving down the field. They didn't really have too much trouble. He still threw for 200-some yards, three touchdowns, and rushed for another 50. He was able to use his feet, extend plays, and throw the ball. He just didn't have enough help around him. But the only reason that UNC didn't get, you know, completely destroyed in this game was because Yodell was there making them relevant and keeping them in this game. And that's why he's a key performer. Next guy on the list, the quarterback for the other team, <laughs> Timothy Morovic for the Wassel Royals. And he didn't have any passing stats. So he had 12 rushes for 99 yards, three touchdowns, 8.2 average. Big shout out to Tim because he's the offensive coordinator for the Royals. And he's the quarterback. Normally, if your quarterback is your offensive coordinator, you're passing the ball. He accepted that they could win this game by just running and that his running ability was an asset to the team. And he put himself in a position where he had almost 100 yards rushing as well as being able to give the ball to his other two weapons in the run game. But as a rusher himself, he was just as potent as ever. I mean, he was. it was just like they had three running backs in this game, and he was one of them, and he was also the signal caller. He was deciding who's getting the ball, what players are going to do, and we're going to do this all game. And I really credit Tim for having, I guess, patience, because me, myself, if I was playing quarterback, I don't care what the weather is, we're throwing it at least 10, 15 times. And to only throw three passes shows that he was committed to his team winning not just him getting his stats because I think it was definitely detrimental to his passing stats on the season, but he has uh, a little bit over, I want to say almost 20 rushing touchdowns this year. So this was one game where he kind of just showed that he could be a great Russian asset if they need him to be in certain games, which this game they did need. So that was pretty good from him. Next I guy on the list, Yaska Vadanen. Linebacker from Sinioki Crocodiles. He had six tackles, three tackles for loss, one interception. I know it was the Wolverines, but number 34 is back, and I'm glad to see him. And this game was just kind of more proof of it because he got to make his presence known. He was everywhere on the field. I mean, I only watched the first half, but in the first half, he was great. Obviously, he didn't really need to play the second half, but I think he did. That's probably where his stats come from. But in the first quarter, you could see him everywhere making plays for this team. Keep it for him. Last guy, also from the Crocodiles, Yane Sarkula, wide receiver. He had three receptions, 78 yards, two touchdowns. But he also had one rush for 16 yards. As a receiver, he did great. He got open. He was one of the reasons of like 85 reasons why they scored these points against the Wolverines. But one reason he was really a key performer was his impact on that one rush. When he was a punter, supposed to be punting the ball, he dropped it, it was wet, and he had the wherewithal to pick it up and run. And athleticism to actually get past people, just a heads-up play by him. But it was just one of those plays that kind of exemplified the type of player he is and he was in this game was he's going to do what the team needs and he's going to be great doing it. And also, when he scores touchdowns, looks pretty good out there uh, wearing number one Ooh. seven. So that is the key performance of the week. Flag football in Finland. Yes, the annual AFF Turkey Bowl flag football tournament is back for the fourth consecutive year. This year's five-on-five flag football tournament will be held on November 11th at Mukala Sports Hall in Lati. Men's and women's teams are invited to play in a fun and competitive environment with bragging rights on the line. Registration is open until September 1st, so sign your squad up today. Registration can be completed at AmericanFootballInFinland.com forward slash turkey dash bowl. 
We all know the results of last weekend's games, but let's explain which team won or lost their game. And let's get to the first game. Which is versus Roosters. First, let's do it this way. Everybody just tell me who you got, win or loss, and then we'll go and explain it. Q, who you got, win or loss? Lost this game. Roosters lost this game. Easy. What about you, Chris? Agreed. The Roosters lost this game. I think it's a clean sweep. Roosters lost the game. <laughs> go ahead, Q. Tell us why. Uh, well, for one, um, I mean, they were up, what, 18 points? Um, I think they only scored three points in the second half. It was 31 uh, to 13. Yep. Yeah. So it, in it, the fourth quarter. It, it was a number of things in the second half that I didn't like. For one, the play calling offensively from the Roosters. Um, it was very aggressive still and just sporadic. Uh, it was times like like they were trying to like uh, the plays they were running was kind of like, oh, let's we're running out of bounds. It was saving the clock. It was like some weird play calling going on. And then um, they're in what, the 11th game? I think it's 11th, 11th game, whatever. Ninth game, whatever. Um, and I'm not saying the Roosters coaches don't pay attention to certain details, but everybody in the league knows that Senadinos stares down the receivers that he's going to throw the ball to. Um, and they haven't fixed it. We've been I've been saying it from the beginning. That's why he was throwing so many interceptions in the first part of the season because he, sta- he was staring down the receivers and he hasn't changed it. Zach Wright watches film. Obviously, you could tell he watches film. That's why he was so confident breaking. Did you on see these, that first one? Yeah. Like, I just want to explain that on that first pick, Zach Wright was playing like high safety and broke on like a flat route. Yeah. And he yeah, he already before. knew he was throwing it. Yeah, he, he knew he was he going broke. to him. So, like that was crazy. Body off. He doesn't look him off. Anytime you playing with an aggressive, uh aggressive safety, I don't even say aggressive safety because he easily could have pump faked him. Um, but he knew from watching film that if Zach looked at his receiver, he was going to him. That's the only way he was that comfortable breaking on the ball. And that's the best pick you can possibly get right there. Coming to the flats and the quarterback actually throwing the ball twice. <laughs> twice. And that right there, Zach interceptions put uh, kept them in the game. And then after that, they just didn't have any really offense after that. And And it sucks because I felt like the Roosters defense got put in a bad place because of them, because yes. of those turnovers, it put the Roosters, they, they had bad field position. The second half is like, like if I'm a defensive coordinator, pissed off my offense in the second half if we lose like that. Like I'm pissed off because I'm like, what are y'all doing? We have we did everything we, we, we possibly can do. But the only reason they got 14 points of that 18 from y'all. <laughs> yeah, you're right, you're right. You know what I'm saying? They got 14 and 18 from y'all, so they back in the game because y'all turning the ball over. And it's not even like they made him work for it. It's like he stared the receiver down. But And then, then the other thing, too. I think at the end of the year when the Roosters make their offensive plays, or offensive highlights or whatever, we're going to see a whole bunch of goal routes and a whole bunch of seam routes. It's like it's like they don't, they, they're only comfortable throwing those on the regular. And you can only do that so much. The Butchers have a defense. You got to be open. Yeah, like the defense, the Butchers defense isn't, aren't slouches. You know what I'm saying? So I think, uh, I think, I think the Butchers also put their set, put themselves in a bad predicament too. Going man, they went man with like 50 seconds left in the second half. <laughs> like I was like, this is when uh, uh, Santu beat them deep. They went mm-hmm. man on that play. I'm just like, I don't know what neither team was thinking about. Maybe they were trying to be aggressive. I don't know. That was a terrible call too. But the Roosters is up 18. You just cannot lose a game like that and just come out of the second half and have no offense at all. Um, and it makes it look like Porvo adjusted, but they didn't really adjust to anything. The Roosters just calling sporadic play. Play calling was all over the place. So I think that's why, uh, besides the turnovers, but like we said last week, the team with the most turnovers is probably going to lose the game. And that's what happened. What about you, Chris? What are your thoughts on it? I'm probably going to echo most of what Q said, but I just want to point out, not only were they 31-13 down, but they were 31-13 down, and the Butchers didn't score until there was 7 minutes 15 seconds left on the clock in the fourth quarter. So halfway through the, through the fourth quarter, they were 18 points up, and you yeah. lose the game. That's just That just speaks poor game management to me. Play calling, bad game management, 
Like, why are they not running? Why are they not running a more efficient offense to keep the clock running? Why are they taking risks? Why are they throwing the ball? Like Zach Wright's already picked you off earlier in the game. Like surely that's in your mind. I just don't understand the play calling from the Roosters. I don't understand why they weren't handing it to Hammerline more because he's a baller. Like he was on our key performers of the week. Like he had 118 yards rushing. Why were they not giving him the ball more? Okay, he had 22 carries, but they needed to close the game out. So give your playmaker the ball. I just, I just didn't get the play calling either, as Q said from from the Roosters. It just didn't make any sense. And hey, fair play to the fair play to the Butchers. They turned up. The Dallas Cowboys turned up when they needed to. Yeah, yeah the Roosters yeah. helped them. They still had to win the game, but the Roosters definitely lost this game just through poor play calling and bad game right. management. Yeah. Let's just go. And, over. and look, oh, go real ahead. quick. Any anytime, this is another thing I was saying. Anytime, um, I think the second pick six was like a. Anytime you get a first, I think the Roosters got a first down, and uh, Senadino's ran for the first down. I think it was something like that. The very next play, first down play. Everybody know first on defense. Most of the time, first down is a rundown. Most in most in most cases, first down rundown came out in in th- and and that's another thing. It came out on first down and threw the ball, and that's when he picked sixty. And it was right after they got a big fourth down, first down though. So I was like. Who is calling these plays? Because <laughs> anything like in the second half, you're not supposed to be coming out that aggressive when yeah. you don't have to. Like you're up, just run the ball. You, your running back is is getting some. He's getting yards, so just run the ball. But that's that's all I was. I was like, it sucks when you get a first down, and then the very next play you throw a pick six. What? Like it's not, just, yeah, huh. let's just. I want I want people that are listening to just hear how this happened. Like this, I I think we call it an epic meltdown. But I'm I'm looking at the stats now. I'm just gonna read you the stats and tell you what's happening. Like I'm not even go over like every player or anything because obviously if you watch you watch it. But just tell me if this makes sense to anyone, anyone listening. I mean, you know, send me a message or something. With 9:57 left in the game, the Roosters were winning 31 to 13. So there's 10 minutes left in the whole game. They're winning 31 to 13. And the Butchers go, first of all, a measly 55 yards. Mm. Why do they only have to go 55 yards? Why could you obviously that means they had a good kick return or punt return, whatever, but they only had to go 55 yards and they score a touchdown. So now it's 31 19. Okay. They got some points that make sense. And then mm. the next drive, less than a minute off the clock. I'm just going off of the stats here. Less than a minute off the clock, according mm-hmm. and agreeing with what Q said, Roosters throw a pass for some reason. With seven minutes left in the game, they throw a pass that goes back 45 yards, goes back 45 yards for a touchdown. So now it's 31 to 6. To 31 to 26. 26. With, with six minutes left, you're still up by a touchdown. With six minutes left. Roosters at some point have the ball and get to a fourth and one on their own 29. Yeah. On their own 29. And and they don't give it to their running back who's got to be at least 95 kilos. Yeah. Bowling ball. And and can run it low center of gravity. They give it to the tall, lanky Santu Vekamaki under center and he don't get it. So with – what was it? One thirty-three with five minutes left in the game. Five minutes left in the game. The butchers have to go. Let me guess. Twenty-nine whole yards <laughs> to, to win the game. Yeah. With ten minutes left in the game, the butchers have to score offensively. They have a fifty-five yard drive and a twenty-nine yard drive. What is that? Four, put a one up there, seven, 84 yards. You know how many yards the Butchers had at halftime? 84 yards of total offense. And that's all that's all they had at halftime when they only had 13 points. And in the fourth quarter, that's all they had to do to win the game. So their offense did not win them this game. The Butchers in the fourth quarter gave them only 80 yards to score. 
in, in the last drive, a fourth and one, instead of punting the ball and making them drive more than 50 yards because they don't have too many drives in this game. They got what? One. They got two drives where they had to go more than 50 yards to score in this entire game. And instead of making them drive the field, the rooster said, hey, here's the ball with 30 yards to go, and you can win the game with this. And they did. It's, it's just – it's a shame. I mean, in my opinion, from what I saw in this game, Butcher's defense, not good. Y'all didn't play well. They, I mean, the – Roosters were able to move the ball. Their offensive line dominated. They were able to run very well. They passed efficiently, like you said earlier, because of the matchups. The Butchers brought in another DB for no audience. Get rid of him. And yeah. him home. Today. <laughs> Lucy. I mean, him no home offense. Today. Like, it ain't nothing against the guy, but he ain't the one that you need. And yeah. and then on the other side, you know, no one can really – you're not going to have anyone with enough experience to really hold somebody like Santu either. Johannes Johanan was getting open as well. The The Roosters were able to do what they wanted to do in this game offensively. And the Butchers' defense still looks horrible. Um, You got – they brought in the new American playing nickel backer. And him and Nico Royko, best, best for sure tacklers you got on that defense because they can both go side to side, stop the run, and cover. Roosters are going trips wide, stacking it, and you got Nico Royko and what is the guy, new guy's name? Brandon Wellington, both out there, 20 yards outside the hash. And then the Roosters are running read option with a with a light box. And they never they never changed that. They just kept doing it, taking their best two tacklers out and letting the, the Roosters run the ball. So again, Kudos to the Butchers. Y'all did great. It was a good comeback win. This is very excited for you guys. You deserve all the flowers you get for that. But that defense is not going to win a Maple Bowl. Just putting that out there. And if you don't win the Maple Bowl, still the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I mean, I, I got a very easy side with the Butchers this year. You have to win the Maple Bowl. You can't just be good. The Dallas Cowboys are good. They, they are always good. They ain't won a, a Super Bowl in damn near 40 years, just like the Butchers. But, again, just a couple of things about the Roosters. I thought the Roosters played really well. I think they, did. they can come back from this game and on offense and defense look at this game and say, okay, we can beat the Butchers. We can. You didn't, but you can. I mean, hypothetically, you can, and you did for most of the game, but the last 10 minutes – and I still I don't even blame the offense. I again I agree with somebody, what Q said. Somebody like, called Miko Coca Line. Somebody called Miko Coca Line and tell him we need him for these next three <laughs> games. Cause, Cause at this point, bro, I I am just I'm 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 speaking strictly from the defense coordinator, man. I would be pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> I would be pissed off, bro. Like, like, like this is you don't lose games like this. Like you listen, just cannot you lose a game like this. Listen to the stats. Total offensive yards. Roosters, I was going to say four hundred and forty. Butchers, a hundred and eighty-five total yards, and they won. Wow, wow! And then there again, two-sided coin. It's a it's a shame that the Butchers won with only one eighty-five, but let's not forget they gave up four hundred and forty yards. Yeah, yeah. I don't what want was, anybody was... to look at the Butchers and be like. Oh, their defense is no. Their defense is garbage. What was the passing yards for the Roosters in the first half? It was like two thirty something, and then the second half and they only finished with two forty eight. They had like two thirty at half. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. The second half they weren't that able is, to pass. They. That's ridiculous. <laughs> the pick six was in the fourth quarter, but the third quarter, they just there wasn't great passing. I guess I don't know. It was just a field yeah. goal in the four, four, third quarter. That was the only score. Yes, yeah, yeah, scoring goal. wise, they they went back and forth with each other in third quarter, which was fine. It's like you're winning, you don't you don't try to do too much. But then in the fourth quarter, you still don't try to do too much, but you don't do enough. You don't do enough. Yeah. By that time, it was too late. The momentum yeah, the, had shifted. Yeah. Once that momentum gets you, and you, I mean, 
it happened like that. And they were in yeah. Portview too, right? Was it a home game for Portview? Yeah. 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 So I know what the fan I mean, it was probably a lot of Helsinki people there too. But man, this just it was a game that great for the league. I, I love to see this is the, the one true rivalry in the Maple League if people don't know. These are two of the original SAJL teams, 1979 shout outs. Mm-hmm. And it was good to see them both go at it. I, I still give credit to the Butchers. This For the Butchers, I think that this win gives them the confidence they need going into the playoffs. I mean, I don't believe they should have that confidence defensively. But as a team, as a whole, they've got to think that in any situation, they can get out of it because they kind of proved it in this game. I'm still going to give most of the credit to Zach, but also the offense. They only had to go 80 yards, but they still had to go those 80 yards in that fourth quarter, and they did that. And it was one of those situations where they knew they had to score to win compared to earlier in the game where they still had a lot of time. And when they needed to score, they needed to win, the offense came through for them, which I think that they usually do. It's the 440 yards on the other side that's got to be their issue. Because, yeah. I mean, this is like – I don't know how many games they're going to keep giving up almost 500 yards on defense. And, it's, I mean, I guess you can win. They just proved it. You can win. It's the Maple League. Just score points. But, luckily, their defense scored two two touchdowns for them, as well as giving up 400 yards. I don't know how to feel about this. I feel like it was a good game for the Butchers. But I also feel like the Roosters should have won. But I picked the Butcher, so my picking went well. So I, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'm three and oh. I was three and oh. Yeah, we'll get to pick them later. Do you love football? Do you enjoy the AFL podcast? Well, we need your help to keep this party going. If you think you can be an asset to our team, please contact us immediately about joining the AFF squad. Email all inquiries to American Football in Finland at gmail.com. Or send us a DM on Instagram. Second game, Royals versus Crusaders. Uh-oh. Mm. Who won or lost this one? What do you think? I mean, it was kind of one-sided, but still be. All right. What was your – you go first, Chris. What do you think? I feel like the Royals won this game. Yeah. I feel like they managed the game well. They played cold well. They didn't need to pass the ball. Uh, they ran the ball so well that it was just – they didn't need to. The defense played well enough to stop them when the Crusaders needed to be stopped. And that was it, really. You know, Tom Swast was just – he was eating. He was eating. And they still found ways to get the ball to their playmakers like Alpha. Alpha was in the backfield sometimes. He was running jet sweeps. Like they got him the ball in other ways so that they could still get their playmakers the ball. And and he rushed for 72 yards as well and – more of it, 99 yards, and Swast 178. So they had 345 rushing yards on the day with five rushing touchdowns. So, I mean, that, that rush game was was class. Um, the receiver, the new receiver for the Crusaders, I think you said earlier, yeah, his route running is really poor, but he's a big-bodied guy, so they were just kind of throwing it up to him. The slant he scored on the goal line, he was a terrible route. But he just kind he's of like to the spot, but he's just put the ball up, yeah. Yeah, if he just gets in front of a DB, you can't like you can't get in on that play. So they just no. get it to him. No, and the other guy that I was really impressed with as well. It wasn't not only their offense; it was their special teams. So Khalifa had two big returns. One of them he cribbed, yeah. and the other one was the biggest. But the Crusaders' tackling was very bad all game. They missed a hell of a load of tackles, and if you watch those two returns back. There was at least about six or seven missed tackles on both of those returns. So it looked, they, it looked so bad because it looked like he would like literally just stop running. Like, yeah, he didn't sure look like he was moving that fast at all. He's tall also, but he would stop. They would miss him, even though he stopped. How do you miss someone who's not moving anymore? And then he's mm-hmm. like, okay, I guess you're not tackling me. And then take off some more. Like, kid got yeah. speed. Yeah, and it, it didn't look like he was moving that fast either. <laughs> He's got very long strides. Yeah, he's just like a long, long stride length, like you say. But it was, it was, it was good. I mean, special teams helped them as well. But that run game was just class, and it was good to see that the the offensive coordinator didn't get sucked into. Oh, we need to pass the ball. We need to pass the ball. No, hell no. You run for 
You're running for 5.6 yards a pop. Just keep handing that bitch off. Run the rock. What about you, Q? What do you think? Win or loss? Uh, I'm going to say I think the Royals won the game. I called it out last week. I told them everything that they should do. You know, if you go back and listen, I told them to run the fly sweep, run the zone read. Timothy's going to have to do a lot with his leg, and that's exactly what they chose to do, and it worked. I mean, so what Steve did, it, it, and that's the thing with the zone read. The zone read opens up everything else. A lot of times uh, people go away from the actual zone, and then they just go straight to passing. So now it turns into RPO or whatever. But with the way that they have it, Warsi's gonna hit every time. You give him the ball, eventually he's gonna get the yards. He's gonna, he's gonna, and that's what happened. So now that opens up Timothy to keep it on the outside. So he scored off of that. They scored off a, a fly sweep and they scored off his own read. And I think it was something else they scored off, like a return or something. So I think um, like you said, they chose to use their three-headed monster on offense and it worked. Um, probably sh- probably shocked some people, but I think they did um, what they had to do to win the game. I mean, Timothy didn't throw the ball a lot. Um, so when you look at that stat, you're like, man, I can't believe he only threw the ball a few times. But, like, when the running game is working, and it was sloppy out there. The, obviously, the weather was horrible. Um, but you still got to play ball, and it looked like one team was ready to do that and the other team wasn't. So um, I think the Royals won the game. I just want to play devil's advocate. But before I do that, I want to continue to what you said about them running the ball. They knew they was going to win. Some, I think that someone from the first game that we talked about could learn something from this team. If you can run the ball, just run the damn ball. And that's what mm-hmm. they did. They just ran the damn ball. I mean, they did it in different ways, but that's all they did was run the ball. And we just talked about the Roosters probably could have won their game if they would have ran, ran the ball. But enough crosstalk. I'm going to go devil's advocate. UNC lost this game. You know why they lost it? You know why they lost the game? Because they showed up. That's why they lost. They had no chance. They shouldn't have been out there. They should have canceled this game. They're done for the season. Put a fork in them. They're done. Um, I do apologize because I know I picked UNC over the Royals. I said that they had more players than what the Royals could guard. I was wrong. And now I'm going to talk differently about the Royals. I want to talk about everything you you both said, but I want to talk about their defense. Um, we, we've said this about UNC all season, you know, their offensive line can't block a soul, but they don't have to because they have playmakers everywhere else. And they know how to get the ball to those playmakers. Well, what the Royals did that I thought was super interesting was I was thinking, how are they going to guard Seth Rowland? Like in his way of being both running back, sometimes receiver, sometimes he'll be at running back and get into the passing game. They put DeMarco Artis on him. There was a lot of times where DeMarco would be on the edge or at linebacker, and his job pretty much was to spy Seth Rowland. And surprisingly, he did a really good job slowing Seth down. I'm not going to say that he stopped him or shut him down or anything like that, but I didn't think that the Royals had enough people to do something like that in this game. And then you saw that they put Alpha at safety on um, RJ's side, and that helped. Just him being on the same side as wherever RJ was, it worked for them. And when they got to the red zone, he would come down and play corner on RJ. And you saw what happened as a result. The new receiver, the six foot six guy, he had a field day, had like a hundred some yards, but he but like we said, he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna kill you. Yeah. So they they lived with that. They said, we take away RJ, we take away Seth. You're going to get some yards, which is what Riley Odell did. He got some yards. He ran well. He threw well for what's a, what was available. But there wasn't anything available to him to change the game. They didn't have enough. And I just want to give credit to the Royals uh, staff, players, defense, whatever it was, that wanted – I mean, I think the Royals team as a whole has showed us – that they are committed to doing whatever it takes to get in the playoffs. This was yeah, a game been like that. on both sides. <laughs> yeah. that, the offense, I mean, that was crazy. They ran it all the time. But defensively, I really was surprised at how well they adjusted to guarding the weapons of UNC. Because I, mm-hmm. I expect the Seth Rowland to, like, you know, have a day, RJ to have a day. Another thing, <laughs> if I was RJ Long – I would feel disrespected right now. 
because when the Royals played against the Steelers, Alpha played corner whole time on Vincent McDonald. When they played against the Royal, the Roosters the second time, Alpha played corner on Danny Kidner whenever possible. When they played UNC, he was never really at corner. He only came down in the red zone when they knew it was going to be one-on-one situations, which to me means that they didn't see anyone as a threat at that wide receiver position, even though RJ was out there. And he didn't prove him wrong. He made a couple of catches, but ultimately he played within the scheme and he wasn't a, a yeah. he wasn't a primary target for the offense. And Yodell threw it to where the open receiver was, which happened to be on the other side because off scheme wise, RJ wasn't open. And that's just an issue that I think UNC, if they had a chance to make the playoffs, they would probably need to fix. But you know, it's over now, and now you can do about it. Represent the community and buy us a coffee. AFF is run by volunteers who love the sport and want to give you the best coverage of it as possible. In true Finnish fashion, we love coffee and would appreciate any donation to help us buy a cup or two. You can donate online at buymeacoffee.com forward slash AFF23. Last game of the weekend. Probably the best one, right? Wolverines versus Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Oh, <laughs> Win or loss. Throw it out there. You, what are you thinking? Cross one, man. Come on. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I think we can just Cross easily, one, man. It's yeah, easy. Easy. Very right. easily. Um after the first quarter, I pretty much was done. I think Crocs did a really good job getting Christian Powell out. He only played the first quarter. Zach Whitehead, the quarterback, only played the first half, I think. I don't think he played in the third quarter. Or if he did, maybe he played. Yeah, 21 was playing quarterback. I think yeah. 21 came in and played quarterback. Toy- Toyville plays corner. And they sat him down at corner and put him in at quarterback. The the Crus- – not the Crusaders, sorry. The Crocodiles, they they had their whole backup secondary in. It was crazy. I mean, that's tough. As a team puts their whole – they had all, all their secondaries on the sideline. And I don't even think uh, Thomas – and Nisiatis even played in this game. Like it's I mean, it's not disrespectful. It was warranted. They still won 68 to 0. So pretty bad showing. But did you guys see anything in this game worth discussing? You know, so we can use a little time on the pod. Looking at my notes, I got nothing. <laughs> Zero. I, I, got, I, I got notes, but I got nothing worth talking about. Tumbleweed. Hey, the crowd to the Wolverines. But not quitting, man. Shout out to the Wolverines for taking <laughs> these butt whoopings week after week. You can see that these guys are still going out there trying. You know what I mean? It's hard, yeah. man, to, to to lose all these games and come out there and get hyped up and still want to play and still want to get better and uh and taking these L's, man. You know, um it sucks as one of them seasons for them. Uh, but I think they'll bounce back some kind of way next season and, and, and be a little better. Um I think this season it just was one of those we trying to bring together what we can and, and see what we can do, um, but you know it ain't. It's, it, I know record wise is all bad, but they can they can bounce back from it. It, it sucks. There's a lot. Now, a lot of these these losses they didn't really have a chance in, and uh, that kind of sucks. But you know, it's, they get experience with these losses. You get experience playing. So, um, and more than anything, sometimes I know it sounds weird. Sometimes the the record doesn't really mean anything but it does but uh for them you get an experience they'll be a lot better some some people will take this season and say hey i'm, I'm gonna work on this or work on that and be better next season so yeah shout out to the wolverines either either way you know they're taking losses but shout out to coming out there and still trying to play man because that i know it sucks yeah um just some interesting things about the game it was played in vanta not in helsinki they played in miramaki yeah. They played in the Miramaki Stadium. That was interesting. Pretty cool. Um, there was it, – it was wet. It was raining. I know it was raining. It was really wet, and the ball was slippery. But there were a lot of penalties by both teams. Um, Wolverines had a lot of penalties on both sides of the ball, but the Crocs actually had a lot of holding calls. A lot of holding calls out there in the rain. I don't know if that's something we should be worried about going forward because – Obviously, against the Wolverines, it's not going to cost them. But 
we've said before on the podcast that the Crocodiles, the, towards the end of the season, they don't have a lot of important games. They got a lot of off weeks. They had like a almost like a two week off week period, and then they they played the Butchers, beat the Butchers. Then they had a I think a bye week, and then they had the Wolverines, and now they have another bye week. Like they might have a little rust going towards the end of the season, especially if they start sitting players. I mean, they came out firing all cylinders points wise, but there was a lot of stoppage early in this game due to like just bad playing on both sides of the ball. Um, what else did I got in here? Um, the Wolverines defense didn't look that good without Willie Linford's number one, four, I think he's injured. So without him out there, they, they just didn't look as good, but I mean, how could they, it was the crocodiles. Uh, what else? The fake punt by Sarkola. I thought that was a pretty cool play. He dropped the ball mm-hmm. when he was trying to punt it because the ball was wet, and then he decided to just run. That was pretty cool. I think I already talked about that. What else happened in this game? I'm just trying to spend a little time on here. Oh, they recovered – the Crocs recovered a, a pooch kick. Like They were pooch kicking it all game, and I, I think they recovered two of them. But one of them, there was a penalty, and the other one actually got the ball back. So it was interesting to see them do that in this game because they were trying to keep – I guess keep the ball away from Will Young and Kevin Adams, which is smart mm-hmm. – but they actually ended up getting the ball back a few times. So something to look at or think about going forward when you're playing the Crocodiles is they know how to do that. Uh, that's all I got. I got no more material on this game. Uh, we know who won. It went down the way it did. If you're listening to my voice, you're now part of the AFF community. But don't be shy about supporting us. Head over to our website and order some AFF swag. Get a t-shirt for this beautiful summer weather. Or a comfy hoodie you can rock all year long. And if you really want the drip, scoop up one of our limited edition snapback caps. Everything you need to represent the AFF community can be found on our website at AmericanFootballInFinland.com forward slash merch. So there's no Maple League games this weekend. So we don't have any preview games to talk about, but we will go over. Um, what's happening this weekend in Finland. Uh, we won't be covering it or anything. Like We won't have a podcast or anything about the national team games. But on August 5th are the European Championship semifinals. Finland will be hosting Sweden at 1 p.m. at Miramaki Stadium in Vanta. You can get your tickets at Lipu Pista Fee, which tickets cost seventeen fifty. man. That's a lot, in my opinion. Uh, also the family tailgate for the game. They're doing like a tailgate where you can bring your family and they like paint your face. You can throw footballs. I think they have cornhole or something. And that game starts at 11. Also, if you want to know what the hell the national team game is playing for, the winner of the game will play in the European championship on October 21st or 22nd against the winner of Austria versus Italy. So Austria versus Italy is playing the same weekend in Innsbruck v um, Austria. And the winner of that game is going to play the winner of the Finland-Sweden game. And the losers will play each other for third place. So if Finland wins, they're going to play Austria or Italy. I don't know who's going to win that game. If they lose, they're going to play Austria or Italy, depending on who loses. And then just because we got a, you know, a UK native on, on the pod, UK is playing France, and I found that I did research on this, guys, just so we have something to say. The winner of that game is going to the fifth place. So you're still not as good as Finland, but the winner goes to the fifth place game, loser goes to play for seventh place. And that's what the UK versus France game will be. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Y'all have any thoughts on the national teams? Anything you want to throw out there before we move on? Not really, just wishing both teams, <laughs> wishing the Finnish team and the, the GB team good luck this weekend. Hopefully they both show out, hopefully they both do well. So we don't have weekend picks because we don't have any games. But I am going to tell us the updated rankings just so we can have this on record. Uh, right now, first place, Spencer, 27-6. and six. Second place, Coach Q, 26 and 7. Third place, 
Chris Green, 25 and 8. Fourth place, I'm going to call it a three way tie between <laughs> Finland, Coach Mike, and Perfect because Finland Swami and Coach Mike are 23 and 7, and I'm 23 and 10, which mm. I mean, I have three more losses, but I have three more games also. So yeah. you know, who really knows? And then yeah. after us in seventh is Alex Malchoy, who's 21 and nine. And then there's a after that, I guess these are our bums. Jamal Clay, 17 and 10. <laughs> and Andy B is 16 and 8. And Jabari Harris is 16 and 11. I think at the bottom is just guys. Yeah, just picking. They just they pick just it. I, I ain't mad at them. You got <laughs> <laughs> the cellar dwellers, what I'm going to call them, the cellar dwellers. The bottom feeders. The bottom yeah, feeders. <laughs> at this point, everybody's got almost 30 <laughs> games. And you want to, I mean, you want to get about 20 out of 30, really, isn't bad. Because 60% of these games, right, is tough. But, you know, it's like that. Yeah. So that's the picks. That's it for this episode of American Football in Finland. Hope it was worth the listen. Any last words before we get out of here, guys? No. You guys get healed up, man, and, you know, enjoy this break. Come back ready to end the season the right way. Yeah, just good luck to the guys. As I said before, good luck to the guys on the national team. Stay healthy. Don't get hurt. Um, Yeah, we'll have a nice week off and enjoy it. All right. If you enjoy the show, please follow us wherever you listen to your podcast, as well as YouTube. And don't forget to rate us five stars as well. Anything less tells us you are a hater. You can follow us on the gram and Facebook at American Football in Finland. Until next time, never forget T I F. We go. We go. We go. American football in Finland. Attention business owners and entrepreneurs. Are you ready to connect with passionate American football enthusiasts in Finland? Look no further than the American football in Finland podcast with over 1000 dedicated subscribers and an impressive 20,000 downloads. Your message can reach a captive audience eager for your products or services. Take advantage of over 10,000 monthly social media impressions to boost your brand's visibility. Imagine the impact of your message resonating with this engaged community. Don't miss this incredible opportunity to increase brand awareness, drive traffic, and grow your business. Contact us today to secure your exclusive ad spot on the American Football in Finland podcast. Get ready to score big with your target audience.